Hello everyone, hope you're well and safe. Welcome to Let's Talk More with Rumel Guzar. Today is my studio guest is very well-known personality to Leicestershire and Leicester. We're going to find out how he ended up in Leicester and we're going to learn his love of Leicester. Today is a very special program. As everybody know, today is the first anniversary of national lockdown which is declared by Prime Minister last year, 23rd of March. Let's find out more. Stay tuned. Let's talk more. Edwards, thank you very much and welcome to Let's Talk More. How are you keeping? I'm well, Ramal. It's really great to see you. I mean, it's been a while with this lockdown going on. Yes, of course. David, before we start a very special episode today, one year on the lockdown, many people know about you, many people meet over the years, and uh, maybe many of us we don't know. Just tell a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I've been in Leicester for over 10 years and a dean of the cathedral, um, but I'm not a Leicester boy. Well, I think I'm an adopted Leicester boy now, actually. Um, I originally uh, grew up in Northern Ireland over on the west side of Ireland, quite near to the coast, but in a bit of uh, the province that was deeply affected by the Troubles. So the area I grew up in, you know, there was lots of violence and stuff as, as part of my growing up. And I suppose... I think I learned then something about what it meant to live in a diverse society and that when that went wrong, how catastrophic that could be for people. So I think that's probably one of the kind of subconscious reasons why I find myself in Leicester in another diverse place, a different kind of a diversity. But I, I feel it very at ease here, although I do miss the sea. Uh, that's the one thing that living in the center of England means that the sea's quite far away. Yeah, but my family, you know, my mum and dad are still there and so on. So I still have a soft spot for Northern Ireland. So how often you visit? Well, of course, in the past year, I've not been able to visit at all. The last time I was there was in March uh, 2020 for my mum's 80th birthday. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, lockdown coming to an end where I can go and see her again. And uh, I think it's been quite a hard year for, for my parents, really. And my mother has dementia. And so like a lot of people, the cutting down of social contact has had quite an impact on her. So what sort of reason you move into Leicester? Uh, well, I'd been working in London for quite a while. I'd, I used to work at a place called St Martin in the Fields, which is a very famous church on the edge of Trafalgar Square. And then I'd been a vicar in Wimbledon. And I'd sort of come to the end of that phase and was looking for the next thing. And uh, I'd never been to Leicester, but I applied for the job. And um, well, here I am. And uh, and I feel that very at ease here. There's something about the scale of the city that I really like because it's big enough to be a city. So there's enough kind of things going on to interest me. Um, uh, but I meet people I know, you know, when I'm out and about, you know, I bump into you or other people. And that gives a sense of, a, of it being a friendly place. And also it's an easy place to get out of. When I lived in central London, you know, it took me two hours just to get out of London. Whereas, you know, within 20 minutes, I can be in the countryside here walking the dog, which I really love. How, is, how you can describe your love of Leicester? Um, well, I like, um, I love Leicester because um, I think, I think people who are here are generous with one another in a very quiet kind of a way. We're not very good at kind of blowing our own trumpets at times. And sometimes that has a negative side to it. Um, but I think we're a tolerant place. Um, I love the fact that um, you can walk down the high street here and hear so many languages from across the world. Um, I love the fact that um, um, there's a richness of culture uh, and diversity. Um, having the theatre here, having Curve and Phoenix and all of these things, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a cultural animal. And when I lived in London, I really loved availing of the culture there. But I can do that all that here as well. Um, and I just feel at ease in the place. Um, I Yeah, and uh, when other people come and visit, they're always surprised that, I don't know what visions they have of Leicester, but it's it's not the reality. And the fact that there is, you know, his history here, as well as a very diverse modern society, I, I, it's something about that dynamic which works really well. And yeah, I'm at home. David, many of uh, know us, your title is Dean of Leicester. Can you describe what's the role of Dean of Leicester, please? Okay, so I guess the Dean of Leicester, um, 
on the the easiest way to describe this, I, I look after the cathedral and the team at the cathedral, and I make sure the cathedral is there for the entire city and county, not just those who are Christians and not those, just those who regularly come to church or anything like that, but there as a kind of sacred space in the heart of the community. We sometimes describe our mission to be a beating heart for the city and county, the sense of uh, something that's lively and organic and, and brings life to others is really what, what I'm about. But also as the Dean of Leicester, I'm part of the wider church community and part of the wider civic and public leadership of the city and county. Um, I always think that, you know, when there's something to celebrate, we need to do that really well. But equally, when there's something to be sad about and to lament or cry, we need to do that as well uh, as the other. And so as the dean, I feel very much uh, in a privileged role um, making the space of the cathedral and making the space of the church available to others. Past many years, you've been doing this role and many events like Richard III, many role visit. One of your favorite event, can you describe? Well, given that this is March, I always think about the Richard III events because they happened in March. And ex I mean, I can't hardly believe it, but actually it's 10 years ago, 2011, when the university with the Richard III Society started the project to do the dig. Um, and so always, I mean, whoever is born thinking that they're going to end up burying a king or being involved in, in an extraordinary bit of history like that, you know, that was never on my horizon. And it put me in touch with the most amazing group of people, not only in Leicester, but across the nation and indeed across the world. Um, and, um, and those days, you know, the city really came to life. And I love those days when the city comes to life. And, and as you say, other royal visits have been significant. But I think burying Richard III uh, 500 years after his death, um, yeah, th those moments will be with me for the whole of my life. David, today's one year on since lockdown declared by the Prime Minister 23rd of March 2020. It has been an impact to all of us. What impact personally have in your life? Uh, well, it's had a big impact personally, like everybody else. Uh, I've been locked down and the sort of sphere of my operation engagement has suddenly gone from that to that. Um, in normal life, I would be out and about a great deal, meeting many, many people every day. Uh, and now the only place I meet people is on Zoom. And I can spend, you know, 10 hours a day in front of a screen. Um, and although it's good to be with people on the screen, it's not the same as meeting with them. I've been really conscious of the dramatic impact on the city centre. I live right beside the cathedral in Cathedral Gardens. And of course, normally Cathedral Gardens is only ever empty on maybe Christmas Day in the afternoon. But it's been empty day after day after day. And it just doesn't seem right. The city is meant to be full of life and energy, but it's not been full of life and energy. But of course, the only people that have been around in the city centre have tended to be those who are most vulnerable, most marginalised, those who are homeless, those addicted to drugs and other substances, those really struggling to kind of make sense of their lives. So suddenly, you know, I've been very aware of those people. I've been very aware pastorally of people who have suffered from COVID themselves, including some people who have suffered from long COVID and the trajectory of their healing is still very uncertain. I've been very mindful of um, the hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, and I've heard stories. They've told me about the pressures that they've been under, the sense of risk they've taken themselves. And of course, I've been very aware of those who've died. In Leicester and Leicestershire, it's about 2,300 people, roughly speaking. And that's the most enormous number. Um, um, I don't, I think those sort of numbers, they kind of go over our heads because we can't really comprehend them. It's only when we hear the very individual personal stories that suddenly it comes home to us. But when you multiply that up, that's a scale of grief and loss 
that is very, very significant indeed. And and whilst rightly, you know, it's spring and it's a year on and we're beginning to think about opening up, I think we have to wrestle with the loss and the grief that we've experienced corporately as a society. And of course, we'll need to invest hugely in the reconstruction of our life. But there's going to be a long tail to COVID. It's not just as if suddenly we're going to kind of come to an end of this and we wake up the next day and everything's rosy again. It's not going to be like that. The implications of this are going to be with us for a very, very long time. In the same way as, you know, when we experience a serious illness ourselves or when we have our own personal grief, it, it just doesn't go in a moment. We become changed as a result of that. I think some of that change is for the better, as well as some of it being detrimental. I think we've really sort of come face to face with what really matters to us. And we've discovered that many of the things that we thought were important aren't that important. And we've come back to really basic things like love, connection, family, health. Um, th those are the things which really matter. And I suppose if I have any fear about it all is that we'll quickly just try to pretend as if it hasn't happened and we'll kind of jump on the bandwagon again and my diary will fill up with endless stuff and I'll end up not paying attention to the things that I've learned about being the most important to me. If I ask you, what's the most challenging, especially for yourself in, in lockdown? What's the most challenging thing in lockdown for me? Well, I think like everybody else, uh, I've... Uh, I've been aware of my own need for well-being and for uh, keeping my mental health as good as it can be. And so that's meant, you know, trying to have a routine and a rhythm to my life. It's meant trying to sort of eat reasonably healthily, do some exercise, walk the dog, all of those kind of things. And to um, pay attention to my... Uh, my spirituality, to my faith, um, and to all of those aspects of my life. Um, because I know that when I when I get these things in balance, my overall human well-being will be much better. And I'm very mindful that I'm doing that not only for myself, but for the sake of my role and 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 the life of the cathedral and all of that. I had to make people redundant last summer. Uh, I've had to do that before in my life. It's a really horrible thing to have to do. Um, and particularly when they're close colleagues, friends. Um, but you can only do that if you've got a, a reasonable kind of integrated sense of self and a, a self-awareness about it as well. And just to be very honest about it, to, to recognize, you know, I'm not a machine. I, I feel those things as much as anybody feels them and to try and maintain that humanity throughout that process. Yeah, so I, I would say it's been hard. You think in, uh, you mentioned your, about your faith, you think it's been locked on, especially in the, right now, everybody had a really small to large mental health issue. Yeah. Has in mental health affected you? Uh, yes, I mean, um, uh, the lockdown started when I was signed off work for depression. So even before the lockdown started, I knew something about this myself. And indeed, it was really bizarre because just as I was beginning to feel a bit better and sort of getting ready to kind of go to my front door again and kind of uh, uh, meet the world at large, the world at large suddenly went closed down. And so it was a very odd sense of timing for me. Um, and, and, as I was kind of coming out of my own dark times, um, others were entering into them. And so I had to be very self-aware um, during that time. Um, and I had to be, I had, I was very conscious that I could have easily got tipped back into a downward cycle again, as particularly carrying the responsibility of others with you. It, it's very easy to do that if you're not careful. So yeah, m my own mental health has taken a turn, um, but, um, and I don't, again, like, like all of these things, addressing one's mental health isn't a momentary thing. 
it 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 it, it just doesn't you know it, it's it's about a long uh, trajectory it's about trying to live life as well as you can recognizing that that attention to our mental health and our inner life um, needs to be part of everyday life it's not just something now or in this moment of covid it it it's something that that goes on and and there's still taboo isn't there you know i'm conscious even talking to you about this as a as a priest as a senior clergyman as a leader in public life it's still not fashionable to talk about these things does your faith help especially in lockdown i think my faith has helped um i've noticed things about the christian tradition um which is my tradition which are very shaped by previous experiences of uh plague and pestilence when you when you open stories of the bible you know there's all kinds of stories about when people were facing kind of similar things and and it's funny how you you know i i know these stories well but how you don't notice them when when they aren't part of your daily kind of life and experience so i i f- i felt um connection with those stories also in particular um there's one section of of the bible which is called the psalms they were written as poems or as hymns sometimes attributed to king david and many of them are really joyful ones um you know uh, rejoicing in the gifts of god and and creation and all of that but there's actually there's more of them that are um songs and poems of complaint and lament you know kind of you know my god my god why have you left me like this why have you abandoned me why does it feel like like i'm at the bottom of a, of a great pit full of darkness so those psalms and songs they they articulate in poetic form our feelings and and of course like a typical man i'm not always the best at articulating my feelings but having some words that belong to another time another another culture and an, another era but which nevertheless connect with my experience kind of gives voice to my own feelings and my own experience and i find i found comfort in in them and i've been pointing other people towards them as well uh and they even include some ones which are pretty angry they're pretty kind of fierce in their articulation um uh as to what's going on and i i think i think it's good to rail at god about it sometimes and it it's good to kind of say what it's really like and if god can't hear that well it's not a very good god then really <laughs> i kind of say um needs to kind of connect with the whole of human experience uh, whether it's anger sadness or joy and my faith speaks to all of those things do you think during this time especially in lockdown people came more religious or people are questioning their faith because over 100,000 people has been lost their life and sadly many of us have lost job or businesses well i think the statistics suggest that on the whole people have become more religious during this time rather than less religious a bit like you i think i expected the opposite maybe to be the case you know particularly when people start asking the questions about why suffering and why does god allow it and all of that sort of thing but you know those are old conversations and they'll never go away people will keep on arguing about that but i think people have discovered in uh, you know particularly if they had a kind of latent faith that some of that they 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 rested on it again they kind of turned back towards it i think the other thing which has happened uh, for all um community's faith is that because our buildings have mostly been shut uh, for the majority of lockdown we've had to go online and that's been a new experience for many of us us uh, many of us and they've also attracted new audiences so it's interesting that for example we're we're in the christian season of lent at the moment we're coming up towards easter and and christian churches always have lent courses and things where people can gather together and talk about their faith and so on so our lent course has members uh from not only leicester and leicestershire but across the country and indeed there are people from america joining in week by week to those conversations and so suddenly the the internet and the online life of faith has kind of has taken off really in surprising ways now that's that's a challenge for us um in in churches and temples and so on because as we uh, get back to having worship again in those places we're also going to have to provide worship online 
And so suddenly we're going to have to operate in two different spheres of life, which with the same resources we had before. And like we've suddenly got to learn, like you, how to be a good journalist and how to communicate uh, in ways that, that work well online. Um, and so it's a, it's a new kind of frontier for us, really. And faith will have to adapt and change and faith communities will have to adapt and change uh, and avail of those new opportunities ahead of us. But I would say, on the whole, um, people have have dug deep into their own faith. And I've heard many people speak movingly about how their faith has sustained them. And it certainly sustained me too. What's your hope for next 12 months? My hope for the next 12 months is that we don't go completely nuts and go mad, but that we still realize that we live on with this virus. And although many of us have been vaccinated, including me, we still have to take care of one another. And, you know, Jesus famously said, famously said, love one another and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so we've got to kind of put love into practice again in new ways, wearing masks, washing hands, keeping distance, all those kind of things are love in action. And we've got to kind of come together in fresh ways to revitalize our city and our county. We know that um, some businesses will, will not see the light of day. Uh, we know that we're going to have to reconstruct uh, the whole way we do things. But time and time again in this city, I have discovered that we can do those things, but we can only do them together. And so I hope that many people are going to reach out towards one another afresh and to rebuild the city and county, but to do it carefully uh, and to not find ourselves back in yet another lockdown, uh, because that would be really too difficult for us here, having been in lockdown for so long. So yes, imagination, uh, look with hope to the future. One of my favorite definitions of hope is hope is love stretched out into the future. So I hope we have a future that's as hopeful, but that's characterized by love being stretched out into it. David, thank you for speaking to us and we wish you best of luck all this difficult time. And what's your final message? People are watching this. Uh, my final message is one year on, remember with great love those who have died those who have sacrificed a great deal for the sake of others and emulate that sacrifice in your own life as our doors open and as our future hope emerges. I hope we all learn something new. As David mentioned, be strong, stay positive, stay safe and follow the Godwin guidelines. We all did very well. We worked together and we will come out for this challenge very soon. Yes, of course, today is 12 months on for national lockdown and I wish you very best of luck for your loved one, for yourself. And really sorry for all who have lost their loved one and have many challenges in their life, like losing a job, losing the business. But be stay strong and stay safe. I will be back next week with a new guest. Let's talk more with Ramil Gulzar.